I saw the Tacoma Narrow dying with it. I have been near death many times in my life, but not even in my worst experiences in France did I know the feeling of helpless horror that gripped me when I was trapped on the bridge this morning. The Olympic Peninsula, extending northward from the lower end of Puget Sound for a distance of more than 90 miles, is separated from the mainland throughout its length by the waters of the Sound. At its narrowest point, Tacoma Narrows, the width of the Sound is 4,600 feet. In 1937, the state of Washington created a toll bridge authority, which was empowered to construct bridges within the state. By June 1938, an amount of $6,400,000 to build the bridge across the Coma Narrows was secured. Construction started in January 1939. The plans called for a suspension bridge having a central span of 2,800 feet and two side spans of 1,100 feet each. The structure of a two-lane roadway with two sidewalks was supported by two cables 39 feet apart and by stiffening I-beam girders 8 feet tall. Each of the two main cables is made up of many strands of iron wire. The cables terminate at each end of the bridge in concrete anchorages. The Tacoma Narrow Suspension Bridge was ready to be opened for vehicular traffic on July 1, 1940. After the usual ribbon-cutting ceremony and speeches, the official motorcade crossed the bridge from the mainland to the peninsula. After the Tacoma Narrows Bridge was open to traffic, its unusual behavior was noted by a number of motorists. This behavior was described by an engineer associated with the bridge project. Immediately after the bridge was put into service, many motorists who crossed it commented on the extraordinary oscillations of the roadway. These oscillations, or waves, were sufficient to cause discomfort to occupants of cars, and some motorists made long detours to avoid recrossing the bridge. The oscillations were in a vertical direction, some having up and down motion as large as five feet. The amount of up and down motion did not seem to depend on the wind speed. It seemed wise to us to make a systematic series of observations of the oscillations of the bridge. We observed, first, motions of considerable magnitude with wind velocities as low as three or four miles per hour. And second, the violence of motion was not proportional to the velocity of wind. On November 7, 1940, at 5 a.m., Mr. Kenneth Arkin, Chairman, Washington Toll Bridge Authority, was awakened by the wind. I got up and drove to the Narrows Bridge to check it. I went to mid-span and measured the velocity of the wind to be 38 miles per hour. The bridge bounce was noticeable, but of no great magnitude. Hurrying back to the observation house, I encountered Mr. Farquharson, our consulting engineer. While Ken Arkin was at the observation house, I went to a position on the axis of the bridge to photograph its motion. Suddenly, a motion of catastrophic proportions developed. As quickly as possible, I reached a station just outside the tower to photograph the motion of the bridge. It was quite impossible to operate a camera on the main span, so violent was its motion. I had climbed to the observation house and looked through the transit. Suddenly, the mid-span disappeared from my vision. The mid-span seemed to have blown north approximately half the roadway width, coming back into position with a twisting motion. I yelled to have the traffic across the bridge stopped. Turning back to the transit, I noticed the twisting motion had increased to great proportions. I could not keep the light poles in my line of vision long enough to determine their exact motions. I then saw a car parked beyond the tower on the right side of the roadway. I noticed it suddenly careened to the left side of the road. The driver fell out, grabbed the curb, and hung on for what appeared to be several minutes. The bridge calmed down sufficiently for him to struggle in. As a reporter on the Tacoma News Tribune staff, I had gone to watch the bridge. I drove on to the bridge and started across. In the car with me was my daughter's Cocker Spaniel, Tubby. Not until I reached the first towers did I realize that something was terribly wrong. Just as I drove past the towers, the bridge began to sway violently from side to side. The tilt from side to side became so violent that I lost control of the car. I jammed on the brakes and got out of the car, only to be thrown onto my face against the curb. Around me, 
I could hear concrete cracking. I started back to the car to get the dog, but I was thrown before I could reach it. The car itself began to slide from side to side on the roadway. I decided the bridge was breaking up. My only hope was to get back to shore. I crawled 500 yards or more to the towers. My knees were raw and bruised. My hands were swollen from gripping the concrete curb. But I was spurred on by the thought that if I could reach the towers, I would be safe. I made an effort during a momentary decrease in the violence of the bridge motion to reach the car. But the car began to shift about in a most alarming manner. While I was out on this portion of the span, I took the opportunity to examine the state of the bridge. As far as the eye and ear could detect, the oscillations were causing no distress in the girder. Then, as I was sighting along the outside edge of the bridge, I saw a distinct break in the steel I-beam. From this point on, failure occurred so rapidly that observation was difficult and impression and fact are somewhat mixed. A whole section fell out of the bridge. After this first section fell, the whole bridge, almost at once, ceased its violent twisting motion and fell into a much easier vertical motion. The failure became progressive along the main span, the shock of each successive unloading of the main span producing a corresponding shock in the side span from which I was attempting to make observations. Two of these shocks were of sufficient force as to throw me violently to the deck. Those who stood on the shore and watched the bridge in its death agony still can have no conception of the violence of movement felt by one out beyond the towers. Safely back at the toll plaza, I saw the bridge in its final collapse and saw my car plunge into the narrows. With real tragedy, disaster and blasted dreams all around me, I believe that right at this minute what appalls me most is that within a few hours I must tell my daughter that her dog is dead when I might have saved him. <laughs>